So, Tom, I think this has all happened pretty quickly. And that says to me, this has come as a big shock. Mm. Uh, and the, the royal family already reeling from the deaths of Prince Philip, from Her Majesty the Queen, from the double health blow that we had uh, several weeks ago of Charles and, and Kate. And now this, that our new monarch has cancer. Well, it does come as a shock. But on the other hand, I must tell you that before Christmas, someone, a neighbour of his in Highgrove, did tell me that the king wasn't well and also warned that C Queen Camilla is not perfect health either. So I think that although it seems like it's a great shock tonight to us, I think this has been coming for some time. Well, uh, let's bring in Andrew Neil. Uh, Andrew, you were one of the great newspaper editors. This is one of those stories, isn't it, where it breaks at 6 o'clock at night and everyone is scrambling. I'd imagine the papers will be absolutely full of this tomorrow. What do you, what do you make of this? And in particular, the wording of the palace statement, which I, I've got to say, with my own former newspaper editor hat on, I think this looks quite a serious situation. Well, they told us more than they usually do in these circumstances. They haven't told us anything like the full picture. We don't know what kind of cancer it is, but they told us more than they usually do. They told us more than they did when the Queen was uh, getting seriously unwell. It is a, a huge story. I've been watching the American network. It's the lead story in every American news network tonight. I've been watching French and German TV. It's the lead story there as well. It's the lead story in every major network, I would guess, uh, around the world. And there will be a temptation for journalists uh, to make Harry the story because he's now going to be flying back. And we hope that uh, at times of crisis, or this is a crisis for the royal family, it can bring families together. But I hope we don't make Harry the story. The story is the king. Yeah. And the story is the queen and Prince William uh, and his wife, Kate, who will have to step up to the plate, particularly when Kate gets better, to fill in uh, some of the gaps that Charles will leave behind. The important matter is the continuity of the British state in these circumstances. And the core of the British state has a thousand years of experience in dealing with these things. Not many countries that can say they've got a thousand years of experience. And I'm encouraged by the fact that the king will still carry out a lot of functions in private, including the Privy Council and meeting the Prime Minister and his red boxes, but it's not been thought necessary to create a council of state that would take over the functions, the constitutional functions of the monarch. And I think when you add all that together, that's encouraging. The continuity will continue, and it's very important for us in an election year. Yes. Because the purpose of the monarchy is to provide continuity and stability, regardless of what's happening in politics. Yeah. And we're having an election this year, and it's very important that the monarchy plays that role above politics for the country as a whole. Yeah, very, very good point, Andrew. We've got Roy Nicker, who's the royal correspondent for the Sunday Times, Andrew's old paper. Before I come to you, uh, Roy, I want to read the Buckingham Palace statement in full and then get your reaction to this. It says, during the King's recent hospital procedure for benign prostate enlargement, a separate issue of concern was noted. Subsequent diagnostic tests have identified a form of cancer. His Majesty has today commenced to schedule regular treatments, during which time he's been advised by doctors to postpone public-facing duties. Throughout this period, his Majesty will continue to undertake state business and official paperwork as usual. The King is grateful to his medical team for their swift intervention, which was made possible thanks to his recent hospital procedure. He remains wholly pos positive about his treatment and looks forward to returning to full public duty as soon as possible. His Majesty has chosen to share his diagnosis to prevent speculation and in the hope it may assist public understanding for all those around the world affected by cancer. So, Roya, I mean, that was a bombshell statement. And as always with royal statements, you kind of look for the, the devil in the detail, if you like. And I've got to say, I'd, like I said, I think this is a, quite a serious situation, which has emerged from a not-so-serious situation, which was the uh, procedure for the benign prostate enlargement. This is clearly a separate and, and is a cancer. So it's, too, it's a different thing altogether, and it's more serious. You can't, Piers, um, detract from the fact that cancer is a very serious diagnosis, whatever form it is, and we don't know what form it is yet. Um, we're told, you know, he, he may choose to share more uh, information down the line during his treatment. But just to your point about, uh, you know, always unpicking statements from the palace, I have to say, I actually looked at the, that statement and some of the guidance that we've had tonight, some background guidance we've had from um, the palace, particularly the items about no councillors of state being needed. So we are not going to see Prince William 
or Prince Edward or Anne stepping in constitutionally for the king. It's been made very clear, quite sort of firmly, that constitutionally at the moment nothing has changed. The king is going to keep doing his uh, affairs of state, his red boxes. We just won't see him in public so much. So, yes, it's very serious. He's got cancer. But at the same time, that phrase, you know, he is wholly positive about his treatment and that he is still doing affairs of state. I read that as actually quite a hopeful sign. Yeah, but for a new king of less than a year to no longer be doing any engagements in front of the public, I, I just think, you know, knowing Charles uh, as I have for a long time, not, not particularly closely, but having followed his, his life, this is a tough guy, a very fit guy, used to yomping around the highlands and leading a very fit, active life. For him to basically retreat from public life in the way that he is, yes, he may be saying he's wholly positive, I wouldn't expect anything else, but I, I, I think this must be a serious situation because he, he, he's cancelling all public engagements, apparently, while he undergoes this treatment. I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, cancer is serious for anyone, but I think in terms of sort of retreating from public view, when, you know, depending on what his treatment involves, the palace and the royal family and the king himself will want to minimise, you know, the health risk to him in terms of... It, it's one thing to meet with the prime minister and have an audience with him, as we're told, hopefully he will continue to do that and meet with the Privy Council. It's, a, it's another thing to, you know, be at a, a Buckingham Palace reception with 300 people in the room, which I think is why, you know, erring on the side of caution for the head of state, for our monarch, he's with, withdrawn. But of course, you know, you, you cannot shy away from the fact that the king, as you say, just a year and a half into his reign, is having to withdraw from public life, temporarily, we hope, is a huge blow to him, a huge blow to his reign. And it's going to be a big challenge for him and the family to rally round. Yeah. Uh, Tom, the subplot here, um, and Andrew Neil was quite right, this shouldn't be the story, but it's interesting that there's obviously this massive ongoing rift with Prince Harry and his father, but we've been told from friends of Prince Harry that he's planning to fly from California to see his father, which will be the nearest thing to a, a rapprochement we've seen. You do see this with families when they're warring, is a dramatic event like this. Uh, can bring people together. What do you make of that? Well, I think that uh, rapprochement is fitting. On the other hand, I'm very suspicious uh, because, we, as we've discussed often here, um, Harry's agenda has been so anti-monarchist, has been so disrespectful of the king and the queen and, of course, of his brother, that uh, for him suddenly to turn up in London, not having expressed any uh, concern for his father when he heard originally about the prostrate problem, which is two weeks ago, uh, that's been a period of silence. So suddenly he's flying in. I think it seems two things, not the rapprochement only, but also how serious it is. I don't think it is a benign issue at all. I think you're quite right that there is a, there is a mini crisis happening. Yeah, and Andrew Neil, if I could come back to you uh, for a moment. You know, we've covered the royals for many, many decades and they've always been the biggest story in town. And like you say, the news of the king's diagnosis is leading the news around the world, not least in America, um, where it's huge. I've had loads of calls from people wanting interviews about this already. So you can see, you can see how big a story this is. But does it also point to the fragility of our royal family right now? We've lost the great matriarch in the queen. We lost the great patriarch in Prince Philip. We've now got the Princess of Wales, who's having months off uh, work because of... Uh, we don't know what, what it was that she had, but it was obviously pretty serious. Uh, we've got Charles now, the new monarch who has cancer. You know, if you look at the sort of top... the top list of royals, this is a, this is a big moment, isn't it? I mean, this is a... a like I say, this, this points to the fragility of the whole thing. It's come at a bad time. Of course, cancer diagnosis never come at a good time, but it, it was the royal family. We'd gone from a surplus to famine uh, very, very quickly. I mean, a lot of people would say, I don't mind uh, the king or the queen. I don't mind the very top royals, but I don't like all these hangers-on. Well, a lot of the so-called, my mother used to call them hangers-on. Well, these kind of royals seem to have stopped hanging on. They've disappeared now. Prince Andrew's no longer in, in the game. Prince Harry counted himself out along uh, with Meghan. Uh, the Princess of Wales has not been well, so William has refused himself uh, too. We are now uh, have a royal family that is pretty short-handed. And, of course, this will put huge strain on the Queen at a very difficult time for her, but also more strain on William, who was hoping to step back and look after his wife 
he is now under pressure and will succumb to that pressure to get back into public life and pick up some of these public engagements. So it's um, the productivity of the remaining senior members of the royal family who are able to do what royals should be doing, and there are not many of them anymore, but that will have to increase in the weeks and months ahead. And I think the other thing to look for, look, this is just a breaking story, Piers, as you know. We do not know what kind of cancer it is, the whole cancer is scary and bad. We do not know the treatment that the king is getting or what impact the treatment will have yeah. on the king himself, which I think is very important. So I think in the days and probably the weeks ahead, we'll get a better idea of whether the king, whether the king will be able to carry on in private with his important duties and eventually come back to the public life or whether it's so serious that even in private, his duties are now hard to, to carry out. That, to my mind, is the thing to look for in the weeks ahead. Yeah, I completely agree. Sarah, I mean, Andrew's so right, isn't it, that the number of top people in the royal family available to do the functional work of the royal family, which is huge. I mean, they all do hundreds of royal engagements a year. These can be big ones, small ones, but they're serving the people. That's the deal, the contract with the British public there aren't many of them at the moment able to actually work. No, and, and, and those that are working already have packed schedules. Princess mm. Anne, for example, mm. has an incredibly busy yeah. diary. And, and the king is going to be relying on his sister now, also on uh, Sophie, uh, the Duchess of Edinburgh, on Edward, the, the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, and Prince William. But as Andrew was saying, Prince William was hoping to take some time out to be looking after his wife and children. Next week is half term. The children will be home from school. Kate not really able uh, to be carrying on as normal. But we had the announcement today, and I think the timing of that was significant and choreographed, that he's back to public duties on Wednesday. He's going to be hosting an mm. investiture at Windsor Castle. He's got an event on Wednesday. He needs to be seen, because as the late Queen used to say, you know, the royal family need to be seen but to be believed. remembering... William will be very worried about his wife. And worried Ca about his father. And Camilla will be absolutely, you know, heartbroken about what's going on with Charles, the great love of her life. Never mind the public duty stuff. Yeah. She's going to carry on with her duties. Then presumably some of them will have to pick up some of the kings at some stage if it carries on. But she'll also have... In her own world, this is a devastating moment. Yes. And it's, sometimes it's easy to forget and the so human to beings be supporting him through his treatment yeah. as well, because we don't know what impact it's going to have on him. You talked about reading line, between the lines of the statements. Uh, now we look back on some of the words that Camilla has said over the past couple of weeks. Mm. Initially, when she was asked, she said he was doing fine. Last week, she said he's doing his best. Yes. Uh, when she was asked yeah. how he was, and that takes on a greater significance. Now we know what has been going on. Okay. Uh, 